We're going to start the next session here. So if you take your seats, uh, we will begin. We have uh, here today Martin uh, Kiss, uh, who uh, is actually a Helian uh, MVP. And he's going to be giving you a presentation on uh, the efficient um, web deployment pipeline. So a big round of applause for, for our next presenter. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation for this uh, HP slot. Anyway, I'm not an M HP employee, but everybody thinks that. Um, I basically am an OpenStack ambassador from one way, and I did a lot of interesting things since the very early days of, of OpenStack. So we basically built up the OpenStack community in the Central European region. I'm located in, in Hungary, uh, near Budapest, and uh, I'm doing a lot of uh, OpenStack-related uh, work, specifically contributing back some side projects, uh, like the community portal of the OpenStack Foundation, and working on some question and answer sites, and uh, also integrated uh, the OpenStack ID authentication project into the OpenStack infrastructure. So I have a lot of experience related to software development, and I like to share this connection between the software development and application world and OpenStack and uh, how can we operate properly and develop properly software for the cloud. Um, basically, the thing that writing software is hard. We can experience that every, every day. And uh, if somebody starts to develop a project, he needs to make some initial decisions. He needs to select uh, software, project management methodology, um, need to find out the dependencies on third party or the external modules, need to choose a platform or an application, application stack. So, so it is not easy. It, I guess it was easier maybe five years or 10 years ago. And if we are thinking, starting to think about uh, websites, it, it seems to be a very simple thing. But uh, making website is getting harder and harder those days. Because imagine we need to provide uh, multi-device support. We have very different uh, frameworks. And uh, if we like to deliver some customer face application, we need to think about the testing and user experience. And, and basically, developing a website is, is it's not a trivial thing if we are delivering it for the enterprise. And uh, uh, basically, OpenStack um, is a very interesting infrastructure as a service solution. It is a very important part of the, of the software operation. But, but it is an infrastructure. So we need, to, we need to add some additional layer to it. Um, so basically, um, if we want to operate in a, in a cloud model or an agile way, we need to se select a very flexible development model. And for example, if I'm looking around in, in uh, Central Europe, most of the startup companies are already ad adopted this agile model. But if I'm looking around in the telco sector or the large enterprise sector, they are doing the software development in a very traditional way and it means uh, very huge and long, long development cycles, and uh, they have some quality issues. So basically it means for, a, for this traditional model, developing a software uh, means a very huge cost uh, for the development side. And uh, if I see for the, some very interesting Hungarian startups, for example, Prezi, maybe you heard about them, or, or Ustream or Logmin, they are very successful, they have very small teams, and they are very, very agile, and they can release software very early. Basically, they adopted some rolling upgrade models, so they can release softwares even daily or hourly. And, and we see the huge difference on the market between the enterprise and, and the startup methodology. 
And it, it is a very interesting thing because usually the enterprise have a lot of resource, resources, a lot of people, and those small companies really acting with just a few, few guys or few uh, people. And it is working. So basically I have experienced, this is the Scrum model, um, where we have a so-called sprint. And, and we are planning in three different levels. We have a product backlog we have, where we are uh, collecting all of the issues or user stories or new things we like to solve. And the team is uh, selecting the, and prioritizing those tasks and allocating a two-week long period to develop um, those new features. And, and basically, it is a development model, so it is not working for, for customer support. But for development, um, it makes a very nice and very friendly environment for, for all of the team members, for the uh, developers, because for this two-week sprint, we define the, the tasks they need to, need to finish. And they are trying to do. So it, means, it doesn't mean that they will finish everything at the end. But uh, it, is, uh, it is based on, on the um, team collaboration. And usually, it is a progress. A new team won't deliver very quickly uh, every solution. But, but maybe within a month, they, they will uh, solve more and more problems. So it, it is very interesting to see how it works in the real life. And uh, at the end of the two-week sprint, two-week sprint, they will deliver a so-called product in increment, a product that can be released for, for the customers. And uh, they can start everything uh, again. So basically, it is, it is a development model that we cannot use with the traditional um, application and opera operating environment. Um, basically, a very important part of this model, the last step, when we need when we get a product increment, and we need to release it somehow. And basically, we are holding some project repository. Maybe you heard about this Git thing, where we can hold the versions of the software. We can hold the feature branches and the so-called release branches that we will release for the customers. And, and usually, we have some operating issues. Basically, we, we get some hot fixes that must be released very, very often, or we, we need to deliver some very important security fixes. I think it is a very current problem of, of uh, uh, the act actual IT that we have uh, solved the security problems. So we need to define a very proper release management policy. So Agile doesn't mean that uh, we have a very free form model. Agile means that we have some standards and policies um, we, need, we need to follow to deliver some very good quality software at the end and deliver um, in time. So basically, to support this uh, type of uh, um, Agile development model, we need to build a proper tool set. So basically, OpenStack is using something similar, or so we are using that for the OpenStack community portal, that uh, we have a repository where the developers can uh, commit changes or check out the current status of the project, make some patches or bug fixes. And, and if the dev developer is finished his uh, work, he is uh, dropping that in the, into the continuous integration system. And it is very interesting that the continuous integration system will do a lot of automatized uh, pretesting of the software. So if the scripts decide that my patch is wrong and, and, it, uh, and it is not working, that I have a chance to, to try again and, and fix my bug and, uh, and pass this gating process. And after that, when the scripts and the robots decide and software decides that my uh, patches patch have the proper quality, then a um, so-called manual review happens. So there is a team who can review my patch from human aspects because we don't have a, a well 
we don't have the proper uh, quality for the scripts or software yet, so, so finally the human decision is very important in, in this step. But it is a typical quality assurance uh, process. So we can raise the quality of the code that we are putting in the final release. And uh, if the ma I get an acceptance on the manual review uh, process, then a so-called post-building uh, part starts. And, and this post-building uh, can do a lot of different things. For example, it can automatically create a, a, a package for my, my application and de deploy this package in the staging system. Or if uh, I'm not doing a, a simple bug fix or a feature commit, uh, for example, I'm tagging a new release, it can deploy into the production system. So this process is, is uh, entire automatical. So it is automated. After a manual approval, no human will touch the, the software. And it is very important that we can, uh, we can remove a little bit the humans from, from the project and, and raise the quality of the entire, entire software. So it definitely works if we are doing a frequent deploy. And this agile methodology uh, requires a very fre frequent uh, deployment. So imagine if you are start to do it by hand, it can, uh, take a lot of time and, and I need to allocate a lot of resource for that and we have a very huge chance for the human errors. So basically um, this is the deployment model we are using for the community portal actually. And uh, one other, other very interesting aspect of the development model that we need to set up a very identical application stacks, both for the software developers, for the staging area, and the production systems. And maybe you heard about this Vagrant story. Uh, Vagrant is a very nice little tool that helps us to set up a very similar um, developer environment that we are using in, in, in the production or the staging environment. And using this model, we can avoid a lot of uh, issues related maybe uh, different uh, package versions or different uh, software stacks. It, it is very common. I met with a lot of developers who are doing some web development, even for larger companies, that they are just uh, setting up some PHP framework or something similar on his own machines and doing the development. And finally, when they are trying to, to um, deliver that uh, for the production stage, ev everything uh, starts to fail. And, and this, is, this is the reason why we need to use uh, those tools and need to de deliver a very similar and identical environment for even for the developers. And, and this Vagrant is, is just a small script that I can, um, small command line tool, and I can hold all of the, the configuration settings related to Vagrant in, in a very simple source code file, and I can even hold it in a version, uh, uh, versioning system. So basically, this, this is the ultimate answer to the worst for me problem. I met with that a lot during the last, last uh, few years. And, and basically, uh, real life, real life Example, we are doing uh, some Drupal-based website development. And uh, it is very interesting to see that uh, Drupal is a, is a web framework. And we see this movement that a lot of uh, enterprises are replacing the proprietary uh, web frontends with some open source-based uh, solutions. So basically, we have this Drupal, WordPress, and Joomla as an alternative. And uh, we chose uh, Drupal because uh, it has a, a very open and, and strong ecosystem. It's based on open source and have a very nice community. So it means that we can access all of the source code um, for even for the core Drupal project and for the external modules. It has a large and active ecosystem. And, and basically, it has a lot of tools we do not need to invent. 
Um, and from that aspect, it some form uh, supports our continuous development uh, efforts. Um, and even it delivers some security support. So every project or module I upload to the Drupal org website uh, get a review from the security guys. So it means that uh, I do not need to do anything because uh, I will get the security bulletins. I need to write good quality code, that's the basic, but uh, I will uh, get some security support from, from the Drupal org security team. And uh, Drupal even have very nice enterprise references. Uh, even Whitehouse uh, website was uh, b based on Drupal. I don't, I don't know the actual, actual uh, status. And we made some gover government project for the EU where we used uh, Drupal in a government environment. So basically, Drupal uh, provides a lot of command line tools. It has a very nice modular layout and have standard roles for development. So we can find the role how to how we need to develop a website, how we can separate the de development into different parts, for example, backend development, front-end development, and, and for the site builder role. And um, usually we think that a website is a very simple something. But basically this is the very simple re and big picture of an Drupal uh, application stock and architecture, how a real life Drupal uh, deployment looks like those days. So it is not, not, not the web shop of, of the neighborhood guy, it is, it is the proper application stack for an enterprise grade uh, web solution. And, and basically at the top we usually have a system load balancer, um, we have a varnish cache that can store and pre cache the, the rendered web pages. Um, we have a so-called elastic pool of uh, Apache and, and Drupal applications. And we have a, another cache layer that holds an internal key value for, for example, for session data and internal hooks and, and similar things. Of course, we have a database at the end, a standard uh, traditional uh, relation database. And if we are building something uh, that requires uh, Google-like search and content search uh, feature set, we are adding an Apache Solar cluster. And uh, if we are thinking about cloud, or we are thinking about the worldwide presence, which is, which is common in those days where we need to uh, deliver an application in 24 per 7, um, usually we are storing all of the assets and, and images in JavaScript and CSS in, in an external object storage or a content using a content delivery network. So we can, uh, we can distribute the, the load of the website all around the world using those modern services. And uh, so basically, it is not a trivial thing to set up an enterprise uh, website. Um, if I'm checking the internal layout of Drupal, this is the directory structure. And uh, we have a so-called Drupal core that the Drupal project delivers. And, and uh, it, it is doing some very basic things. And uh, of course, if I'm doing a deployment, I will have some moving parts like the files and some images and maybe the configuration is related for this, that specific deployment. And of course, uh, we are not using the core module. Usually we need some special feature um, or, or some different content types or, or uh, similar things. So we are starting to uh, develop a so-called custom profile, uh, which holds our modules, uh, web skins, all the translations here, if we are thinking about the multilanguage site, and, uh, and some custom libraries. So, so this blue part is, is uh, our addition to the, to the project. So if you think, uh, start to think about the steps of the deployment, how we, need, how, how we can to deploy that into a staging or a production environment, and, and doing the release, make, basically building a release 
uh, we'll include the step where we will copy the files from the Drupal core and the settings, the configuration, and all of the custom things in, into a single, single directory structure. So, so if I like to deploy, I have a so-called legacy manual way where, for example, I set up a, a Apache and MySQL environment um, and manually building the course and modules. And finally, when it is done and I have a configuration file, I'm installing it. But it has some disadvantage because it seems to be that it, is a short, it have a short deployment time. Um, it is true if I need to do it once. But if I try to adopt those agile technologies and I need to do maybe a new release in every, or deployment in every hour, it, it is a huge disadvantage because it is very hard to, hard to maintain or upgrade. Uh, if I have some custom patches for uh, upstream modules, it is also very hard to maintain. So if I'm doing it frequently, it is, it is a huge pain. Um, I have a, another uh, solution or option here because uh, Drupal has a very nice tool set and it uh, supports uh, a so-called makefile. So in this makefile, uh, it is an example of that. I can define the, number, the, the version number of the Drupal core. I can define the additional modules. And usually, Drupal is not perfect and sometimes I need to deliver some custom patches which is not included in the upstream or it is related to my corporate project I don't like to release back. So even I can define my custom patches in this make file. So it is very easy because uh, after using this Drush make tool, it will build the entire directory, directory structure, the entire Drupal distribution uh, based on the, this make file. So basically, it is very easy to upgrade. So if I see a new module release, I simply need to rewrite this uh, version number. Or if I s hear about a new security upgrade, I, I just need to upgrade my module, this new version, and rebuild the entire project. So with this make file, I can separate the custom code from the upstream, and uh, I can build a very clean environment from scratch. So it means I can repeat uh, all of the deployment steps. But it has a disadvantage, it is still a manual process. Um, I guess the ultimate solution we, we are using that uh, we will combine this make file with a continuous integration and a continuous deployment systems. So basically, we are using that uh, in the OpenStack infrastructure. And uh, after the end of this, uh, this process in the post-building uh, stage, we are just using a make file and rebuilding the entire re portal from scratch and, and deploying it into the staging system. So. It is def definitely the automated way we need, to, we need to use Drupal in an enterprise environment. And uh, basically, it means we have a very short setup time. After this drush make, we are just building a, a package. E even it can be a Debian or a Red Hat package. Uh, we can publish a manifest file about the the latest version of, of uh, the distribution we made, and we can trigger and install and upgrade. And the question comes here, how to install or upgrade this, uh, this uh, Drupal site we, we prepared and packaged? Um, because actually, in, in the, for the community portal, we have a lot of Puppet scripts for that and we are still building this manifest and, and package file, and uh, we have a very custom solutions of different scripts that is trying to, to physically deploy into an instance of this uh, uh, distribution we made. So here comes this uh, HP de development platform as a last mile of, of this uh, deployment uh, uh, process. 
because it is based in, in Cloud Foundry, and, and it is tr trying to do something similar we, we did with uh, OpenStack, that uh, it is an open source platform as a service, and have a very similar governments and, uh, and uh, ecosystem like uh, we have here in OpenStack. And, and it defines uh, REST APIs, so we can access the features through a user interface or, or a command line tool, or even we can write our own tools uh, and drive this class foundry uh, using, uh, using a REST API. And the other point that it is very easy to learn how to use it in the real life. So basically, the developers uh, doesn't need to be expert system administrators and don't need to know too much about the cloud because they are getting a very nice API or user interface to deploy their code. If we are looking the layers of, of the Cloud Foundry and how is connected to OpenStack, basically we, we have an OpenStack infrastructure that is working. Usually, if we are not using some private cloud uh, deployment, we, we can use a public cloud uh, infrastructure based on OpenStack. And, uh, and those Cloud Foundry nodes uh, uh, sitting on top of this OpenStack infrastructure. So when I uh, uh, like to start or deploy a new application, Cloud Foundry will uh, or can create uh, even new nodes in this OpenStack infrastructure, and all of the application will sit on top of that in, in containers. So it is a very effective way of using of, of the resources. Um, if you are looking um, a little bit deeper in this uh, Cloud Foundry, um, and uh, we compare how we could build up a web application environment from scratch, we can see very similar components. Because we have some router at the top, so, so Cloud Foundry can manage the, even the auto-scaling of instances or can build up an application pool. Uh, so our application can be scaled out into multiple containers. So we can even build up some, some load balance or, or failover solution there. So the very important part is this application lifecycle management, a cloud controller, and this application execution part um, that can uh, uh, provide or orchestrate our application into, the pl into this platform as a service solution. And if I rolling back to the previous uh, diagram where we had this uh, Drupal architecture, we saw that basically our architecture, well, our application is just a very small part of the story. And, and we have a lot of external services. We have an external service, this Varnish cache, the memcached or Redis backend, even database is, is an external service and Apache Solar Cluster is an external service. And uh, this platform as a service model separates the, the components exactly that way, because we have so-called service brokers. And, uh, and for example, I can, I can define my application that I need a database. And I do not need to deploy a database service. I, I, I need just consume the the database service from, from this Cloud Foundry or through this Cloud Foundry. And uh, it have a lot of other services built in, for example, a RobitMQ Q or, a, or a shared file system. And, and we can even uh, extend this part of, of the Cloud Foundry. And, and of course, what we get, we have a built-in matrix collector and very important Part, we have a application log aggregator. So if we are deploying our application into, into this platform as a service, we can get a feedback about the, the events that happening inside our application. So if we are implementing proper logging, we, we can see it through the Cloud Foundry. So it is uh, very nice even in a user interface, if I launching or upgrading an application, 
I can follow what happened inside. So if I like to implement a, a proper application environment with this, I need to set up some, some log aggregator system. So it is a lot of work. And if I like to do an application deployment in the real life, it looks uh, that way. Basically, I have a command line tool. Um, I need to log in there. I have a login account. And basically, I'm just pushing my application into the, into the platform as a service. And at the end, I will get a running, running project. So there is an example of how to create a MySQL database. So basically, it is uh, deploying an application means one, two, three, four, five uh, uh, commands. So, so it is not bad. If we are thinking about how to do it in a manual way, how much uh, commands I need to, to issue uh, to launch my application or upgrade an existing, existing one, so it is five commands, it is, it is not bad. But uh, we have a very nice solution to decrease this, this number of commands. We can define a so-called manifest file where we can define our application and all of the service relation we need. For example, this Drupal application, we are defining a so-called build pack. I will tell, it, tell a few words about that. And we can define all of the services our um, website will consume. For example, this example, it is consuming just a database service. And this build pack, a very interesting thing. Um, we have uh, build packs for Java, PHP, and different platforms. So we can reference in this manifest file to this uh, build pack. And when I'm launching my application into the platform as a service solution, it will build up the application environment based on this build pack. But it can be anything. So we have a lot of ready-made build packs. It, it is open source and available on the on the GitHub. But if I have a very custom needs, even I can write a very simple bash script. Um, so it is very extendable. And if I have this manifest, if I add this manifest file to my uh, Drupal distribution, for example, I just need to do a Helium push command to upload it into, for example, a, a staging server. So as I mentioned before, we have an API for that. And if we have a continuous deployment system, we can include this single command and the login part uh, into the post-building job. And we can get a totally automated uh, um, solution for, for application deployment without any human intervention. So platform as a service, build pipeline element, why, why it is good? Because we can standardize our, our processes with that. We can rethink how we did the, the deployment before. Um, we can use the common tools provided by the different frameworks. We can eliminate the manual work. And we can lower the cost. Because we are building frequently, we are focusing on the quality. and. Uh, we need to focus on real problems. We need to allocate resources for, for deployment. And at the end, it means that we can deliver faster and we can win the market. And I like to share two very short user stories regarding that. Um, we have this Penseo company. They are a Genève-based digital communications agency. And, uh, they are working mostly in the sport industry and, and converting old proprietary uh, enterprise websites into, into Drupal. And we started a pilot project with them. And uh, they are doing exactly that. So they are standardizing their release management processes. They are working in automation and of deployment to staging server. Basically, they are using Jira and Bamboo for continuous integration. But as a last mile step in the build server, they are, they are uh, deploying uh, this Cloud Foundry instance. And why they 
need that because they are doing very frequent deployments. We started this uh, pilot program to build up a staging server. And uh, they have uh, very f different products for, for different uh, sport associations. But all of the application stack, because they are using Drupal, is very identical and very similar. So they can build up a completely automated deployment uh, system using those tools. And I am started uh, on a proof of concept project. Um, I think it will be a little political challenge to push it through. But uh, as we are using Drupal for the community portal, we have this last mile step to deploy a portal using Puppet scripts and some ad additional magic. And I like to start to standardize this process and use a platform as a sol solution to host all of those services we are using uh, these days. And uh, basically, we have everything else. We have the continuous integration system based on Jenkins. Um, the similar tool we are using to build the entire OpenStack uh, project. Okay, thank you.